Thanks for joining us. This is Ears to Hear, a podcast brought to you by the 25th Street Church of Christ in Columbus, Indiana. Check us out online at 25thstreetchurchofchrist.com for directions and meeting times. We appreciate you tuning in. Now, let's get into God's Word with Ears to Hear. We'd like to thank you for joining our podcast, Ears to Hear. As usual, my name is John Hines. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ here in Columbus, Indiana, and my co-host, as usual, Andrew Walker. Good to have you today. Andrew, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, John? Oh, we're doing pretty well. Having having a good week. What we're going to be talking about this week is we're going to be dealing with the question of whether or not a Christian should vote. And I asked to sit in with us. Uh, we have Greg Walker with us today, and Greg is one of the elders, one of the shepherds of the congregation here. Greg, thanks for being on here with us. Sure, John. Had to- had to find out what you're all doing up here. <laughs> I, I understand. We're, we're up to great things. Um, but, but introduce yourself a little bit and talk about why, um, why we had you on today. Well, John, um, I think it's because you've had some recent conversations around uh, the role of government and what the scriptures have to say about that role. And as well as being a shepherd here, I'm also involved in state government. I've been a, a state senator for 15 years. Uh, so in the Indiana State House, I'm a member of the Senate. There are two bodies, the Senate and the House. Uh, and I've served in uh, District 41, which is parts of Bartholomew and Johnson counties uh, for the duration of uh, my service there. Um, creates a lot of opportunities for me to uh, see things from a perspective maybe that a lot of uh, our own congregation members don't see it. Uh, in the same light that I do. And, and uh, seeing behind the curtain has also uh, given me a, a new perspective on how government works and how it doesn't work uh, and creates an opportunity for me to try to influence uh, the process along the way. Yeah. Um, it's not an easy, not an easy thing to do. And I'm sure, um, I know me and you, you and I have spoken about it privately and it's it's a difficult thing to think about a Christian serving in that arena just because there are people do have questions. Mm-hmm. And I know you've been doing it for a number of years, but I, I know a lot of people have questions. I know a lot of young people have questions. And the question, like I said, that we're going to be talking about today is, is should a Christian vote? And to just think about the questions and the concerns that sometimes people have is, Usually the people that we're voting for, if we are voting, and I'll preface, I'll preface everything with this, a person does not have to vote. If they are, if their conscience, uh, they should not violate their conscience. If they don't think a Christian should vote, then by all means, they, they should not vote. So we'll preface it with that. But now to think about some of the issues people have, the people that we're voting for are often not Christians. They're usually not Christians. So people will say, well, should I really be supporting a candidate, a man or a woman, who is not a Christian? And does my vote for them, does that equate to some sort of fellowship in in some sense? Should I should I be entangled? And they they see it as an entanglement sometimes. You know, we're we're told in scriptures, set your mind on things above, not on things below. Right. And they they say, well, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. Why should I be concerned with the affairs of men? Andrew, if you wanted to answer that real quickly, how would you answer it? Well, I mean, we are citizens of the kingdom. I think it should be the priority of of us here. But you know, the Bible's clear; it acknowledges that we also do live in the kingdoms of men. Um, we're not we're not completely detached or isolated from the world that we're in. Um, otherwise we would have to go out of the world, I think is how, uh, is how Paul put it. Yeah. I mean, we're here, uh, as long as we're alive here, we are going to be subject to the kingdoms of men, whether it's this nation or other nations or other governments, whatever it is, we are, we 
are going to be um, have the uh, the affairs of this world, sure. and, and we are in within the kingdoms of men. And, and you know, maybe something you said earlier, you know, maybe some of the some of the times the candidates that we're faced with, um, you said may not always or, or often may not be Christians. Right. Uh, another piece of that is sometimes they might present themselves as Christians because that's a checkbox for their target, you know, voter base or target demographic. Yeah, Sometimes man. the title of Christian gets kind of used, right. but not in a very, um, not in a very comprehensive or, uh, genuine way by, by candidates. Sometimes it's, it's sort of a, a title, um, right. to get the evangelical vote. You know, if that, that's the thing that you hear in the media a lot is, yep. you know, the evangelical vote very it's much so more of a label than a, a lifestyle. Yep. But, but people do have concerns simply because the candidates, frankly, they are not perfect. And even within the last the last few elections, um, I'm fairly youngish, sort of. I don't know. I guess I'm middle aged. But just in the last ten or fifteen years, and you look at the candidates that were running candidates that were running for president, and it can be discouraging. Just as you you see the the morality of these individuals, and you realize right away, wow, they're really not perfect. They are, they are in no way perfect, and, and so then you ask, well, should I be supporting someone who is, who is not perfect? And, and a lot of folks just have questions about it. So, how would, we, how would we answer the question, should a Christian vote? I mean, we'll get it. <laughs> Greg, you want to chime in? Are politicians perfect? <laughs> well, only 99% give the rest of us a bad name yeah. is a common joke. <laughs> Um, so when you talk about supporting someone or, or endorsing someone, I think, uh, it's good to acknowledge that there's multiple ways to vote. We talk about voting with our dollars. Where do we right. spend our money? Uh, what, which grocer do I support? Which, uh, which doctor do I take my family to? Which, uh, plumber do I allow into my home? I think there's lots of ways to vote or endorse someone. And, and I think in those instances, we wouldn't necessarily, say, well, I'm just going to stop buying groceries because I can't find a Christian grocer in my area, uh, or I'll stop seeing the doctor because I can't find a Christian doctor, etc. cetera. Um, so we, we have means by which we make selections that are not um, a, a condemnation of uh, our, our vote when, when we can't find the perfect candidate to vote for. Um, I've often said and heard said uh, elections don't make good things happen but they can keep the worst things from happening. And I think that's an acknowledgement that uh, no politician is perfect, no system of governance is perfect. Um, I don't remember who gets accredited with, uh, you know, democracy is a terrible way to pick leadership until you compare it with all the other systems of government in the world, and then it doesn't look so bad. Hmm. So because it's the affairs of men and the rule of men, we just have to go into it understanding, of course, it's going to be flawed. Of course, it's going to be an imperfect uh, judgment, um, but we, we put judges in courts. We put politicians in charge of legislation and administration and executive roles, and, and none of them are going to be uh, use the full counsel of God and do so perfectly. There's also concessions in that in, in my role, I'm with uh, 49 other senators, and there's another 100 in the House. Uh, so even if I could cr uh, craft and draft perfect legislation, uh, it would be uh, tantamount to impossible to get that passed by um, all individuals in those bodies. It's still a collaborative effort uh, to, to determine what the laws of Indiana should be. Yeah, it, that idea of the other forms of government. I mean, when we look in Romans 13, and it's let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. That does not mean that God dictated how governments are governed, how, how nations are governed. Mm -hmm. So to think about, we here's the verse of, for the authority of the, the governments, frankly. And so then it makes you ask the question, well, okay, if you don't like this form of government that we have, share with us... <laughs> What, what form do you want? Um, do you want it to be a dictatorship? Do you want it to be like kingdoms of Europe in times past where it's passed down by family to family? Mm -hmm. Maybe you get a good king. Maybe you have a king that's as crazy as all get out yeah. and you're going to be in it for 80 years now. Or do you want to have some sort of say in the government? 
and governments exist and we're subject to them, I, I would suggest, given that, the question is, as we think about the person who says, well, should I vote? A non-vote in, in the form of government we have, a non-vote is a vote. That's correct. And when you withdraw all the good influence from a situation, if you withdraw all the good influence, then what's left? Mm -hmm. yeah. Then it's nothing but bad influence. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the fact that we try to allow some form of a majority to set the direction of what leaders get chosen right. and what policies get implemented, you know, a, a majority can at least try to temper the extreme outside views, whether right. it's on one side or the other. But if you withdraw yourself from that, you're, you're basically letting the remaining voting body condense into, you know, whatever form that it's going to take. You're, you're diluting your say in it by, by not participating. Right. And you see that I lived in a place one time where um, the schools for a long time had a lot of trouble and the parents of, of a lot of the children, because they didn't like the trouble, they pulled all of their kids out and all those kids went elsewhere. Now, what did that leave in that small school? It left nothing but the negative influence. And it was not the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. it, it just made things worse, frankly, and it was, it was divisive in and of itself. It, to think about the governing authorities, I think some people, they look at the governing authorities, like this passage in Romans, they just look at it as, well, they, they do not bear the sword in vain. And they just view the negative side of government, like we've talked about last week, and talking about policing and, and military and things like that. The same verse in Romans talks about, do what is good and you will have praise from the same. Mm -hmm. That is also government's job. Do you want to have praise from, I mean, this is, and Peter talks about the same thing in his epistle, when it, he talks about praise of those who do good. Well, that's what we're looking for. That's that's what we want. So I think sometimes people just look at the government as this evil entity mm -hmm. that, yeah, it has the right to exist by God, but they don't see it as an instrument for good. You know, it's funny how Nebuchadnezzar was referred to as a servant of God. And you think, well, how did Nebuchadnezzar honor God? And, and in a way he did. Uh, later in his life, it yeah, seems he so. really uh, acknowledged God in a, in a most profound way. Uh, but but the, the fact is God can use people that are imperfect people to accomplish his will. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are things that do come out of uh, the state house and, and I'll dare say even out of Washington, D.C. that are consistent with moving God's um, will forward in this nation. But he's using flawed people to do it and it may be that it takes a circumspect route it may be that it's an action of government that responds in a in a very poor manner to a, a problem in our country where a, a righteous solution was at hand and it because of the failure of leadership it may actually lead to a more righteous position in future govern governors or future leaders and uh, an opportunity to to bring about good from from seeing, you know, the error of our ways. There's lots of ways God works that are not right. as direct as we expect. Right. Yeah. And I have to think that he's got his hand in the lives of people. When we talk about, you know, these not being Christian folks, uh, there are folks trying to be Christians. They're, they're, they're again, flawed as I am too. Right. But um, for all of the, for all of those that have a single purpose agenda that's about themselves, you do have those that are really there to try to serve fellow man. And even when we serve imperfectly, uh, we still get it right once in a while. The blind squirrel <laughs> finds the nut and uh, there's good that comes out of the work that we do. Uh, I understand why people choose to emphasize the negative, though, because it is disheartening when we see a squandered opportunity as right. well in that kind of leadership. You, you know, when you when you mentioned kind of the good coming out of potentially bad decisions, it immediately made me think of Joseph and, and his time in Egypt. Um, you know, that was a lot of injustice, a lot of neglect for what is right and what is good, both on the part of his brothers and on the part of his master. While he was in Egypt, there was a whole lot of bad intentions and evil decisions that were made. Um, but in the end, God was able to use 
the structures that were in place, um, including the Egyptian government, although that's not really the, the point of the account, um, to, to save lives and to, to help save his nation. So, yeah, uh, there's definitely example for that. And I mean, God works in mysterious ways, and his ways are higher than our ways. And to even look at the Roman government, I don't think anybody would debate the fact God was using Rome. I mean, it, it was prophesied, and they played their role in prophecy. Does that mean they were a godly government? No, but was God using, was God using them? Yeah, yeah. God rules in the kingdoms of men. Yeah, he did. Can we always see it? Uh, usually it takes hindsight, um, takes looking backwards through history. At the time you're going through it, you think, how could God possibly have his hands in this? But he, he usually, he does. He rules in the kingdoms of men. I, I was just thinking about the idea of that idea of fallible men. And I was thinking from, from Acts chapter 6 in the account where you have those Grecian widows who are being neglected. And the you know there there was a problem that was affecting the church, and the apostles they summon the whole multitude, and they say therefore brethren seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, and they seek out seven men. But it was given it was up to the multitude to seek out from amongst themselves these mm -hmm. individuals. They held an now, election, didn't they? I, I mean there there had to be something that happened there. The apostles didn't choose them. The apostles laid their hands on them, mm -hmm. but they say, choose from among yourselves seven men. Now I assume they, it talks about, um, choose from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business, but it was up to the individuals. Tell me one of those seven men who was perfect. You're not going to do it. No. Um, I'm not saying they were not good men. I think they were good men, but I don't think they were perfect men. And they had a task thrust upon them, frankly, and they had to do they had to do their part to to try to serve. But it's just an, it's just one example. And you look in the Old Testament, and you see the same thing when when the people come out from Egypt, and Jethro comes on the scene, and Jethro sees Moses judging the people all day and all night, and Jethro says, "What are you doing?" And for one thing, Moses wasn't perfect. He's going to end up losing his temper at one point and not being allowed into the promised land. But Jethro says, you need to appoint people over this. And they chose people, what is it, over, it's like over the hundreds and then over the fifties and then over the twenty. you know. Mm -hmm. And they were choosing from amongst themselves. And I, I think Moses had, was doing the choosing. But still you have the choices being made. And tell me one of those men who was perfect. You're not going to do it. Sure. And, but those, those individuals were being entrusted with basically with judging. It uses the word judging. They're judging between, um, between parties and things like that. But for the individual who says, I just don't feel like I can vote because here are people who, who are not perfect. In scripture, you have examples of people being chosen who are not perfect. And they were being chosen for leadership positions. Mm -hmm. They still weren't perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of it. Well, and as long as we're talking about leaders, the, the way that the apostles gave instruction for picking elders uh, and, and yeah. how elders were to be appointed, it even uses the term blameless to describe the, the men who should be considered as elders. Right. But we know that, that elders aren't perfect people either. We know that that they're people who are instructed to do the best they can and to give their best effort to do the best they can. So, you know, we have, we have imperfect um, men who become elders who are instructed to do their best. We have imperfect people who become elected to office who have to do their best. And I think that the same goes for us when we vote. You know, we can't vote perfectly per se or know the hearts of every candidate, right. um, but we can do our best. If we're worried about uh, our, our vote being a, um, some sort of stamp of approval on some unrighteous individual, how many times did God pick a leader of Israel who was unrighteous to the core and God still selected them? Obviously he selected those that he thought were also going to be effective, righteous individuals who again were flawed. God never picked a perfect leader either. Uh, I think it's too high of an expectation for us to say, I can only pick a perfect candidate for office. There's, there's not that pool to choose from as there was not for God to choose leaders in Israel. I mean, to just ask the question, 
would you vote for someone who was guilty of adultery and murder and all sorts of shenanigans? And most people would not vote for a murderer. And it's like, well, that's David. Yeah. <laughs> he was an adulterer and he was a murderer. And there he was. He was a man after God's own heart because he turned from his sins. Yeah. He wasn't perfect, but I mean, he's, there he is. One of the, one of the heroes of faith. Mm -hmm. my, my view is pr pretty simple. First Timothy four, it talks about, we're supposed to pray for those in authority. And I think a lot of folks, they, well, they sort of stop reading the passage a little bit too early or first Timothy chapter two, that we pray for those in authority for Kings and all are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. If I'm supposed to pray for that, it's sort of like faith. Okay, you can have all the faith in the world, but what about works? You need to have the works. The works manifest the faith. Mm -hmm. If I'm supposed to pray for those in authority, well, if I can somehow be instrumental in having that quiet and peaceable life, well, then why wouldn't I exercise that that right? Yeah, I, yeah, mean, I see it as a wasted opportunity, to be honest. God has given this nation a lot of liberty in choosing leadership, and he has not given that same liberty to many right. other nations. Mm -hmm. right. And they've suffered uh, millions of their right. own countrymen die at the hands of their own government because they don't have the ability to choose. And for God to give us that blessing, I, I feel like it's an incumbent upon us to exercise it in the best way we know how. Yeah, very much so. I mean, just look at... Like I said, just look at the other countries yeah. and see the state of the other countries, not just um, not just from physical blessings, but spiritual blessings as well, where you have countries that are actively suppressing the word of God. Mm -hmm. And here we have an extreme amount of liberties and to not exercise those liberties. Well, you don't have to exercise them if you don't want to, but... If those liberties were taken away, don't cry about it. In a representative republic, you get the government you deserve, I've also heard said. Uh, and uh, a passive uh, uh, citizenship is not the key to an effective government in this country. If we have active, engaged people who can say, I, I want I want my leaders to choose the best they can under the headship of God, and, you know, I have people even to come to my office, constituents, and they'll talk about, hey, Walker, you know, I don't know what all you do, but I know you well enough to know that God is your king. And so I'm okay with that. And so in a yeah. lot of things that are just based completely secular decisions, they're fine with me using my best judgment because they know I'm not going to violate the principle of God in order to accomplish those things. Right. Or at least they hope I'm not going right. to. Right. In, in Acts chapter one, I was also thinking about when they, um, when Matthias was being chosen as a replacement for Judas. And I think Andrew, a minute ago, you talked about, you, you know, we don't know, we don't know people's hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at their fruits and, and things like that. The Lord certainly talks about that and out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, sometimes what comes out of the mouth doesn't exactly match what's in the heart. Uh, a lot of hip hop, a lot of hypocrisy, uh, not just in politics, but in the world in general. But I was thinking about, in, in Acts chapter 1, you do have that same idea as a replacement for Judas was being chosen. And the apostles, the 11 at that time, they said, we didn't know, we don't know, we don't know these individuals' hearts. So they, they say, therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time, beginning from the baptism of John, and verse 24, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you, you have chosen to take part in this ministry. But then verse 26, and they cast their lots and the lot fell on Matthias. Now, and I was, I was looking before we had this program today, trying to figure out what exactly that casting of lots was. And no one seems to be real sure. Right, because sometimes it seems like it can refer to a almost a random lottery, but it may also sometimes be used to refer to more of a vote. Yeah. And it was, some folks think that it was just as simple as you, you have these two individuals that were proposed. So you have, you have the apostles basically saying, okay, we've narrowed the list down the best we, the best we can, but you God, you know, these folks hearts a whole lot better than we do. Right. 
So they prayed about it, and then they cast lots, and people think that it might just simply be, you know, putting a piece of wood or a scrap of paper in, you know, in the individual's lap. And, okay, Matthias has this many, and this person has that many, but they don't know. That's pure speculation. But there was something. There's some sort of casting of lots after they prayed, and after they've said, okay, Lord, you know their hearts, and then they cast the lot. They did the best they could. Was Matthias perfect? No, nope. but apparently the Lord knew that he was the man for the job, and the other individual was was not chosen. But I think that's kind of what it comes down to a lot of times is you do the best you can, mm -hmm. and that's that's okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what other options. Anarchy is certainly not the answer, and I I don't think I think some people may think that that's the answer. But we have we have authority from Scripture for the government. Yeah. So then the question is, okay, if you have authority for the government, you know, we make the same argument about um, things within the church, for example, the Lord's Supper. We are commanded to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, are we commanded to have those trays that have the individual cups and things like that? No, those are expedients. So you have the commandment. Now the question is, okay, how do you fulfill that commandment? Okay, well, you have the commandment for government. Okay, now how do you establish the government? So then the question is, what happens if you have an, if you have a government you don't like? Then what do you do? <laughs> well, the Constitution's got a solution to that. It does say that people can reform the government any time that we choose, um, which was, I'm sorry, that's more the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Uh, but the point was that they felt like uh, God had given them liberties to uh, exercise who was going to rule over them. In fact, that was a topic of discussion among the uh, colonies when they were looking at whether they wanted to challenge the king, the king of England, and his leadership role in the colonies was, do we even have the authority to choose our own leaders? And using scripture... Uh, early writers were able to convince at least enough uh, of the early um, colonists to say, yes, we do have that liberty under God. And in fact, his expectation would be for us uh, to choose righteously. And I know not everybody agrees with that position, um, whether or not you have the right to, to bear arms against the government and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it, that's, that's for a whole nother, <laughs> that's for another episode. Yeah. Um, but I, I was just thinking about, especially for example, in this this past um, this past presidency, and, and just when people would have the attitude, "Well, well, that's not my president," and it's like, "Well, listen, you may not have voted for the individual, but we still have in Scripture we are subject to the governing authorities. Mm -hmm. The person may be flawed, the person may be as godless as all get out, like Nero was in Rome." And yet the Romans are still told, submit yourselves to the governing authorities. And and you see that principle, you know, when it talks about, you know, the masters, even the harsh masters, mm -hmm. you submit yourself. And I think you can make the same application towards marriages, you know, husbands and wives. Well, you know, if a husband is not doing his job, does that give the wife the right to, um, to, to turn him away? No, there's there's still submission issues, and I think it still stands with the government. Well, there's opportunities to, to submit. Yeah, there's opportunities to demonstrate uh, Christian character and right. how you bear up under difficult circumstances. Right, and uh, to to cause a riot and to have an insurrection every time you're not happy with uh, the government um, and doesn't doesn't <laughs> give you a chance to demonstrate that character, that patience, uh, endurance, um, submission. There's a lot of things that are that God calls positive roles or positive attributes that most citizens of this country don't see as being very positive, to be honest. And uh, so it's a way to shape our, our um, uh, conform our thinking into that which God has endorsed and God sees value in when we are uh, able to endure harsh treatment of other men, turn the other cheek. There's, yeah. There are times to rise up and there are times just to take it. Um, Peter talks about that very thing. He says, for this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Yeah. 
and there's a time for that. And, and I think that's, you know, to kind of come full circle, that's where you do, you have to set your mind on things above. And yeah, we recognize the authority that governments have, but we also recognize there's a higher authority. Um, we recognize we are citizens of the Lord's kingdom, mm -hmm. but as long as we're on this earth, we are also, we are citizens of the nation that we find ourselves in and we are called to live in, in a certain manner. Yeah. I mean, to, to call back to the verse in, in, uh, was it first or second Timothy that you referenced earlier, praying for authorities, yep. you know, the, um, the acknowledgement there is that by praying for those in authority, who are you acknowledging is still in control and is still over the the affairs of men when they're you know making these decisions. You're you're realizing that God can be in control and is in a position of higher authority than the things that are that you're praying about. Yeah. Um. So so I think that you you don't you're not taking yourself out of the authority of the kingdom. You're not taking yourself out of the kingdom and being subservient to another government first by participating in that system. You can still acknowledge God as being the higher power. Yeah. And, and you know, we'll might consider if we pray for those in authority, it's really hard to turn around right after you pray for someone. It's really hard to turn around and curse them in the same breath. Mm -hmm. Usually if you're cursing your government, you're probably not praying for them like you should be. So we know what we're called to do. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a, it's an interesting topic and it is a topic that a lot of folks uh, have questions about. So hopefully we've dealt with some of those issues and, um, people are fallible and, and we recognize that. And just as much as we recognize other people are fallible, hopefully we recognize that we ourselves are fallible mm -hmm. as well. So when people say, well, I'm not going to endorse someone who's not perfect. Well, thankfully the Lord is perfect. And thankfully the Lord died for us, even though we were enemies. Romans talks about while but we were aliens. Yep. While we were aliens and um, sojourners. Yep. Very much so. But good topic. Greg, appreciate you being on the Thank podcast you, with us this week. Hope everybody has a good week. Andrew, have a good week. Take care of yourself. All right. We'll do same to you all. All right. Appreciate everyone tuning in. Appreciate you having ears to hear. Hope this study has been beneficial for you. Be sure to share it with people that you know, and we hope you tune in next week as well. Thanks for being with us. All day.